you are welcome to my youtube channel this is your teacher again science bro today i brought for you another video on what we call acids and bases i've left out salts for the interest of shortening the video otherwise i'll discuss salts in the next video because salts are associated with acids and bases so before i start i request that you hit the subscribe button to get notifications whenever i post a video and also keep me going please just go below this video hit the, the subscribe button then you can continue watching remember watch it up to the end because we are going to break down what we mean acids and bases in a simple way now in this topic here called the acids and bases i brought for you several subtopics to guide us through this lesson here the first subtopic is going to be meaning of an acid i think you can see right here meaning of an acid we are going to discuss what is actually an acid then we're also going to look at ionization or dissociation of an acid ionization in simple terms the breakdown of an acid into its component ions so we are going to see what we mean by ionization because we can't understand an acid well before we understand terms like ionization and dissociation number three we shall look at types of acids and we shall give examples of acids so stick to the end of the video we shall also look at the strength of an acid what is to be strong if we are saying an acid is strong then we shall also look at the basicity of an acid then look at the meaning of a base and an alkali then look at the physical properties of acids and bases then we shall drop into indicators and the ph scale then we shall also look at the chemical properties of acids and bases then we shall look at the importance of a special reaction called the neutralization reaction then we shall also look at finally the applications of acids and bases in real life so let's dive into the first subtopic here called the meaning of an acid meaning of an acid now you'll find so many definitions about an acid but the key standard definition is we are going to define an acid as a substance which when dissolved in water produces hydrogen ions as the only possible charged ions a substance which when dissolved in water produces hydrogen ions as the only positively charged ions now in chemistry water is actually used by acids as what we call it an ionizing solvent or a medium to enable the acid to break down now there are many other substances which if you put in water they will also break down or they will dissolve now for them they will have possible ions but as long as the the only possible ions are not hydrogen ions then that compound cannot qualify to be an acid now uh we have said it produces hydrogen ions as the only positively charged ions we shall explain deeper what we mean by that when i am now dwelling into what we call ionization or dissociation of an acid let's touch ionization or dissociation of an acid ionization stroke dissociation now we have said an acid will only show acidic properties when you put it in water because water will act as a solvent to make the acid break down into the key ion called hydrogen ions the hydrogen ion is also called a proton 
That's why acids can be said to be proton donors because they release or donate protons into a solution. Now, what is to ionize? At our level in the scoop of this chemistry, this ionization we are going to keep it low. But as you advance with chemistry, the two terms ionization and dissociation might differ a little, but at our level here, they mean the same. Now, what do they mean? The breakdown of an acid immediately you put it in water is what we are calling ionization or dissociation. So dissociation is the breakdown of an acid into hydrogen ions and other negative ions. So ionization is the breakdown of an acid into its constituent ions. Now, an acid will not break down if you don't put it in water or if you don't put it in an ionizing solvent. If you use another solvent which is not water, an acid will undergo reactions and produce some other ions, not particularly hydrogen ions. So when you put in water, an acid will produce hydrogen ions and other ions which are negatively charged, negative ions. The hydrogen ion is also called a proton, which is represented by this symbol H ion, because hydrogen has a valence of one, so strictly we give it a positive ion like the positive charge. So this is what we are calling ionization of an acid. Bases can also ionize, can also break down if you dissolved it in water. Otherwise, an acid will not behave as an acid in the case there is no ionizing solvent or there is no water for it to ionize or break down. So let's look at what we call types of acids, types of acids and examples. Then we shall give some equations of how acids are ionizing. Now we have basically two types of acids. We have acids called organic acids. Then we have what we call mineral acids. So we have the organic acid. Then I'll have another section, mineral acid. Now, the word organic refers to anything obtained from plants and animals. So, organic acids are acids from organic sources, which are strictly plants and animals. So, from organic sources, which basically we say plants and animals. Then these are from mineral sources. Mineral sources are actually minerals, and minerals can be metal, metallic. Minerals can also have inorganic minerals or salts. Of course, we have non-metallic from which we can have organic minerals. Here we can have them as organic minerals, organic compounds or salts. Organic salts, minerals, or compounds. So, mineral acids are obtained from mineral sources, which can be the mineral, minerals containing metals, containing salts, and so on. So, these acids are also called inorganic acids. Anything inorganic is not from plants and animals. So, that is inorganic acids. Now, strictly, we can give some examples here. Now, since they are from plants and animals, I happen to carry around with me a mango here, and also I carry the tomato here. Now we see that have an acid called oxalic acid that is found in tomatoes here. Of course, most of these fruits do not contain only one type of organic acid. One can have the main organic acid and other small acids. For example, this Tomato has also an acid called malic acid, which malic acid is also found in apples. So malic acid is also found in apples. Then you have also like tic acid found in milk. Then these, these citrus fruits such as mangoes, the oranges like I've cut an orange here, 
So these ones have what we call citric acid. Most of these citric fruits have citric acid. So we have citric acid. These are from fruits such as mangoes, lemons, etc. Oranges. So all those contain, there are so many organic acids and they occur in different forms. In, they occur as many of them in different fruits. Now, these, many of these organic acids have kind of, uh, they, are, they have huge formulas which might not be in our scope of study. So they will need you as you advance with chemistry, then you'll find to study these formulas. Some have uh, large structures, complicated structures. Now we realize that normally acids are taken to be having a sour taste. Now that sour taste is characteristic of these acids, both mineral acids and organic acids. But we realize that some fruits might taste the taste which is not sour as expected from the theory that acids are sour. It's because some of these fruits contain some other chemical compounds which affects the, uh, the taste of the sour, the sour taste that they should have given. The other compounds are there, vitamins, uh, glucose, so there are many other sweeteners which actually affect the, the taste and make it not to be sour as expected. So you might mistake and say this fruit is not actually uh, having a sour taste. So you can find the sour taste even in some other compound like salts and you get mistaken and you say it's an acid. So an, a sour taste might not be a standard definition to define an acid with. So mineral acids here, we have so many of them in our laboratory so we can have them as laboratory acids such as hydrochloric acid which is also a stomach acid. Can be made in the laboratory or at the industrial scale from these inorganic salts here. So hydrochloric acid is HCl, so called stomach acid. We have sulfuric acid. All these can be made both in the laboratory and on the industrial scale. We have nitric acid, which is this formula, NO3. Now we are going to see, we are going to discuss them in details. How do they ionize? So uh, we are going to let's have it held there now these no, normally these organic acids are actually weak acids uh, mineral acids are very very strong we are going to discuss the strength and understand what we mean by strength so these are normally very very strong or very corrosive so these organic acids are normally very very weak acid and less corrosive though some of them are very very corrosive but most of them are not corrosive as compared to mineral acids here so let's dive into and discuss what we call the strength of an acid. Mineral acids are also so many. I've just written three for you. Organic acids are also so many. I've written a few for you. Now, strength of an acid. What do we mean by strength of an acid? It's just ability to release hydrogen ions ability or is to release is to release hydrogen ions now here we shall categorize the strength into two weak acids and strong acids then i'll split them down strong acid this way then weak acid this side Now, we said that every acid should break down into hydrogen ions and some other negative ions. That is called ionization of an acid. Now, we realize that some acids do not ionize completely. It's like when you break this chalk, if you hammer this chalk and part of it changes into powder, part refuses. So that's what we are referring to in this process here when we are studying strength. That some acids, if you dissolve in water, not all of it splits down into ions. Those are weak acids which have a little ease or little tendency to break down into ions. So they are less, they are weak. So these ones are acids, acids which ionize completely or dissociate completely. 
Ionize is to break down into ions when dissolved in water. Ionize completely. This partially ionize. That means, let's take an example here. We have many acids like the, in the base sting, we have what we call a formic acid or methanoic acid. So we have formic acid in the B string sting. This is found when the B stings you. So formic acid is this formula. When we dissolve it in water, it will have to release hydrogen ion. So we shall have to free this hydrogen. Then we shall remain with this as a negative ion. So I'll have this negative ion. You put a negative, then plus hydrogen, put a positive on it. So, because normally ions from a compound should be both positive and negative. So, we say this is ionization of methanoic acid or formic acid. Now, this acid here, when because it refuses all of it to turn into this side, so we say that this acid has partially ionized and we normally use reversible arrows. A reversible arrow represents a reaction in which not the in, in which the molecule this side does not completely break down into those ions. So in, in short terms, if you add 10 molecules of this, you are going to have maybe five molecules here and five you can have here three molecules and three molecules liberated the other side. So not all of it has ionized or completely broken down. Let's turn this side and look at some, maybe many other examples. We looked at oxalic acid. Uh, this was from uh, tomatoes, has that formula. Also we have uh, malic acid. Some other acids have huge formulas, which we might not write here. We have formic acid, we have ethanoic acid from vinegar. And vinegar is obtained from various fruits. So this is ethanoic acid, which is the component of vinegar. This acid here, there are many, many others, but when we are breaking this acid down, we normally use reversible arrows to show that the acid has not completely ionized. A reversible reaction is a reaction in which not all the molecules in the reactants break down into the molecules as seen in the product. So these ones break down completely and most of them are, are mineral acids. Most the mineral acids. So all the mineral acids, but not all mineral acids, we have said most of them. Then here there are most the organic acids. Most the organic acids are uh, weak acids. Then here, can look at an example like hydrochloric acid. How does it ionize? Hydrochloric acid in this way. Hydrochloric acid will break down into what we call hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Ions plus chloride ions, that same side. So we shall have HCl is the hydrochloric acid. We use a full arrow to mean that all these molecules have turned completely into the other side. So we have hydrogen ions plus chloride ions. So a strong acid is an acid which completely ionizes, producing the maximum number of hydrogen ions, whereas a weak acid is an acid which partially ionizes, producing very few hydrogen ions in solution. So we, we gauge a strong acid and a weak acid from the number of hydrogen ions that every molecule can produce when dissolved in water. Now, if we had 10 molecules of this, mathematically, you can just have 10 of this and 10 of that. So you liberate 10 this way and 10 this way. When the acid is split, when 10 molecules are supplied, they will liberate 10 hydrogen ions and 10 chloride ions. But for such an acid, when you supply 10 molecules, you realize that you have fewer molecules than what you put in this side because some of it has refused to ionize. So you can have some other acids like sulfuric acid, nitric acid ionizing. Okay, let's now bear into the next part called the basicity of an acid.
the system of an acid the system of an acid what's the system of an acid here now the system of an acid is actually the number of hydrogen ions one molecule of an acid are produces when dissolved in water let's look at this that the system is related to ionization so to understand the system we must first break down the acid or we can look into the structure of the acid in case you have a molecular formula so this is the number of hydrogen ions liberated by one molecule hydrogen ions produced produced by one molecule of an acid when dissolved in water or when the acid ionizes produced so we can have let's look at hydrochloric acid how does it break down into ions hydrochloric acid how does it ionize in water we said when you add water to it then you'll form hydrogen ions and being hydrochloric acid you form chloride ions as the negative ions chloride ions you can have also sulfuric acid here sulfuric acid can also produce hydrogen ions every acid has a characteristic of that plus sulfate ions sulfuric acid gives us sulfate ions then then nitric acid gives us nitrate ions carbonic acid which is the weak acid will give us carbonate ions and hydrogen ions sulfurous acid also a weak acid will give us uh, hydrogen ions sulfite ions so you'll try that in your reading now this one let's look at the molecular formulas so hcl this is hydrochloric acid it break down first of all of free these hydrogen ions so when you split the acid you don't write h as alone because it will now exist in ionic form so this negative ion chloride ion then sulfuric acid has this formula so it has two hydrogen ions ionizable hydrogen ions in its structure so we use a full arrow to give us hydrogen ions and sulfate ions now what we are putting on top here is actually this is the valency of sulfate and sulfate has a two sulfate has a two so here we have hydrogens we must balance we must show that it release two so we now look at basicity is actually the number of hydrogen ions here here hydrochloric acid produces one hydrogen ion one molecule of sulfuric acid produces two hydrogen ions we shall see some other acids like phosphoric acid produce three hydrogen ions so the cyst is actually the number of hydrogen ions released so we can divide acids into monobasic acid that releases one hydrogen ion dibasic acid is an acid that releases two hydrogen ions like sulfuric acid is dibasic then we have tribasic acid which releases three hydrogen ions like phosphoric acid here we have hydrochloric acid we have sulfuric acid and others like carbonic acid have another weak acid here called the carbonic acid then here we have phosphoric acid and so many other acids this is phosphoric acid sulfuric acid carbonic acid hydrochloric acid so this is tribasic basis is divided into three monobasic monobasic acid dibasic acid tribasic acid there let's go to another subtopic to save time so we are looking at a base now meaning of a base we have discussed an acid so let's discuss about meaning of a base meaning of base and alkali what does a base mean <clears throat> now a base 
has a counter effect on the acid. That means what the acid can do, a base reverses the effect. So a base acts as a reversal effect for the acid. Now that means every acid releases hydrogen ions. So the base will act as a counter remover of hydrogen ions. So when a base releases hydrogen ions, when an acid releases hydrogen ions, when a base is in the same mixture, it will take away the hydrogen ions. So the effect that the acid is causing will not be felt in that medium there. Now, what's a base? A base is a compound containing either an oxide or a hydroxide. So a base is a metal oxide or metal hydroxide, which can react with an acid to produce a salt and water only. So this is a metal oxide. Swiftly must be metallic, metal oxide or metal hydroxide which reacts which reacts with an acid to produce a salt and water only so what is true here is that base plus acid is liberating what we call salt plus water. We say that this topic of a salt, we are going to discuss it in the next discussion. So whenever an acid reacts with a base, then it liberates for us a salt and water only. Now, a base, we say, it must be either oxide or hydroxide here. So we can give examples of many bases. Bases now, examples of bases. So any metal oxide, pick metal with an oxide, sodium oxide, magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, sodium oxide, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide. Here I'm using valences to come up with the chemical formula. Sodium has a valence of one ox oxide, has a valence of two, which is this two. Calcium valence, two oxide has a valence, two, the formula remains. We have copper two oxide. All these are bases. Or you can choose their hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. Any. Like sodium hydroxide. But we realize that all, most bases do not dissolve in water. We can take an example here of magnesium oxide here that I have near me here and I add some water and you observe. So this is the magnesium oxide powder. I've added it some little water here. So if we shook it with water for some time, we realize that it will not dissolve. But of course there are some bases which dissolve. So let's put this down here first and try out maybe with some crystals of sodium hydroxide here. So I have sodium hydroxide pellets here. So I just have some pellets of sodium hydroxide here. I'll put them here. Make sure you cover it because most of these, some of these hydroxides are actually very quiescent. They absorb water vapor. So we add some little water here. And shake for some time. Check for some time, we shall realize that after some time, this, actually this sodium hydroxide, for it, it will dissolve in water and finally you will see a colorless, colorless solution rather than this one here. So after regular shaking for some time, this won't dissolve, it appears as a suspension, whereas this one will become a clear solution indicating solubility of sodium hydroxide and magnesium oxide is insoluble. So most bases are not soluble in water, but few can dissolve. Now the few that dissolve are called alkalis. So a, a base is a broad term, an alkali is a subset in, in a base. So let's now pick some examples of alkalis here. So what's an alkali? An alkali is actually a soluble base. Among the bases, we pick the one that is only soluble in water. 
Water is actually a key solvent to determine whether the substance dissolves or not dissolves. So, let's bear on the alkali for a few minutes here. So, alkali. So, an alkali, this is a, a soluble base and strictly must be a metal hydroxide. So, bases are metal oxides or metal hydroxides. But strictly, an alkali should be a metal hydroxide which dissolves in water. Metal hydroxide which dissolves in water to produce now hydroxide ions as the only negatively charged ions. So alkalis liberate hydroxide ions as the only negatively charged ions. Of course, many compounds will produce negative ions. So an alkali in water, when you add water, it will produce for you positive ions. And positive ions differ depending on the type of alkali plus hydroxide ions. Which are called OH ions. We put a negative because we said they are the only negatively charged ions, then they will be together as positive ions in the in the alkali. Now alkalis are very few, potassium hydroxide, and we also divide them first into strong alkali and weak alkali depending on how they ionize because strength is in terms of is to ionize have potassium hydroxide which is written like this we have very few so this one ionizes so you can guess what to produce positive ions always metal metal ions are always positive so potassium is a valence of one we give it one positive charge then it will have hydroxide ions so these ions give the base its characteristic test or they give the alkali its characteristic test. So weak we have ammonia. So these weak bases ionize partially while strong alkalis are alkalis which ionize completely. We show them with this full arrow. So these ones ammonia solution. They ionize completely. Ammonia solution we represent it like this with aqueous sign. The, or it can be, we can use a simpler language to a student to mean ammonium hydroxide, which is this. When we are ionizing this, of course, we separate this and give it a positive charge, then plus OH ions. So these are called, this is a weak alkali. There are many other weak alkalis, but might not be in the scope of this lesson. So we have other, other strong ones like sodium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide sometimes is included, but it has a low solubility in water. And also magnesium oxide is also very, very low soluble in water. So we normally we have potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, sometimes including calcium hydroxide. So strong alkalis ionize completely, weak alkalis ionize partially. Now the issue that uh, bases and acids are going to differ in something here that we are going to explain here. We've built much on these commercial uh, bases, but many plants and uh, many plants and some organic substances contain some bases for us. We can find out that uh, we have some organic bases, which of course are from both plants and animals. But of course, organic bases have actually very, very short formulas and complicated structures, which, might, which we might not explain now. And uh, they might need you to advance with chemistry to understand those, most of those compounds that have a base character. But we can generally say this plant is basic. Like most leafy vegetables are alkaline in nature, 
We can realize some other examples like banana peelings are basic in nature or have an alkaline character, aloe vera. So examples of sources containing uh, organic sources having bases, there are pretty many, but the base itself, the chemical substance, which is base itself in these sources here, might have a complicated structure. So organic bases are sourced from plants and animals. And we have several plants, like we can have aloe, aloe vera, uh, banana peelings. So like if you are bitten by, by a bee, or you are stung by a bee, then you can apply banana peelings as a counter effect because a base actually does something which we call removes the proton or accepts a proton from water. Now the reason a base accepts a proton is because it has a key ion called hydroxide ion. Hydroxide ion, then an acid has a hydrogen ion. So these two, when a base is added to an acid, then the base which can be because the base has hydroxide or oxide ion so either this or this will be used to remove this in the mixture so a reaction between this and this will liberate for you water this side that's how a base normally at a uh, counter the acid and causes if the acid is sour and you add actually base then the sour taste will be neutralized and actually you'll have a taste like for water so we can now have many many examples purple leaves we are going to discuss physical properties and you realize how do you make a choice of these uh, sources to act as organic sources here now let's look at the next discussion physical and physical properties of acids and bases physical properties of acids and bases now we have physical properties are those properties where we use five senses to observe them so we can look at the tests Acids are normally tasting sour. This tastes bitter. We said when you eat fruits, this taste might, cha uh, might challenge you because of the associated other compounds in those fruits there. So these ones, they feel. These have a sopper feel. Or slippery. Have a rough feel or no, not slippery. Not slippery. Uh, then solubility in water. Uh, acids are very soluble. Base is strictly alkalis. If the base is an alkali, then it is soluble. Those are some of the key physical properties. Then effect on indicators. Effect on indicators, all of them turn the color of indicators, turn the color of indicators, turn the color of indicators. I'm going to expound more on the indicator because there are many indicators here. So let's look at the next discussion about indicators. So many of these bases which have a soapy feel you normally use them to make soap because like purple leaves were used in ancient days uh, to act as soap for washing with some other compounds mixed with it there so let's look at indicators and the ph scale but before you look at indicators we need the ph scale discussed first 
Now, a pH scale is just a scale of numbers running from 0 to 14, indicating the degree of acidity and alkalinity of a substance. So, is a scale of numbers. From 0 to 14. Sometimes some textbooks have written from 1 to 14, but for the choice of this lesson, I just chose 0 to 14. There is no very big significant difference there. But there are reasons for the choice of 14, 1 to 14 and choice of 0 to 14. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 here. Now, from 0 to below 4, you have, this is the pH for strong acids. So, acids have a pH lower than, this lower than 7. Weak acids. So, these are neutral substances like water. Then from here, to below 11, around 11 there. So, here you have weak alkalis. Then from one, two, three, four. Then from here, here you have strong bases. So that's the range for strong acids and strong bases from zero to below four. You have strong acids from four to, be, to around six something. You have weak acids. Uh, so these pHs can be determined in in a, uh, a number of ways. So how do we determine this pH? So this is a pH scale. Uh, the word pH stands for potens hydrogen. Potens hydrogen. The original words used was potens hydrogen, but was uh, rather modified to put power. Potens means the power or potential of hydrogen. Or rather the pH, or rather it just means that the pH is determined by the number of hydrogen ions in the solution. So the power or the number of hydrogen ions in the solution is actually the pH of the solution, which is actually the degree of acidity and alkalinity of the solution. So pH is degree by definition of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Now, pH can be measured using a pH meter, or we call it a pH probe. We don't have it in the laboratory now. Can use a pH meter or pH probe. It has a scale where it just indicates the value. If you dip it in any solution of any pH, you read the pH on its scale. So, or we can use also, the one that we have in the laboratory for easy access is a universal indicator, as we are going to see shortly here. So let's look at indicators. So the idea of pH is very important, especially in agriculture. Let's look at indicators now. Now, an indicator is a substance which changes color depending on Substance that changes color, changes color, depending on whether the solution is acidic or alkaline. That the solution is acidic or alkaline. Now, uh, that means if the solution is acidic, the indicator will show a different color. Now we have several indicators. We have category A commercial indicators. Commercial those that we purchase. Where we have methyl orange. There are very, very many, depending on the purpose and the reaction taking place. Phenolophthalene. We shall only stick to the scope of this lesson. Then we have also litmus paper or litmus solution. Can be a solution or a paper. Mass paper. Stroke or solution. They have different colors, of course. 
Then we have universal indicator solution or paper. Can be a solution or also a paper or a solution. But for today, I only have a solution. Well, it must have both a solution and a paper. Let's look at their various colors when added to acids and bases. So behavior, there are color changes. Color changes of indicators. Changes of indicators. We have the indicator here. Then we have acid, color change in the acid, color change in the base, color change in neutral medium such as water. So we start with the first indicator here. Can have the first indicator called phenolophthalene. Then I have methyl orange. Then we have litmus solution and paper. Mass solution. Then litmus paper. Then we have our universal indicator. It has different, very, very many color changes. So if we might hold it for a while. So, let's look at the first one here. Now, phenolphthalein is a colorless solution, so it is colorless in neutral medium. Methyl orange is orange, as the name says. Litmus solution is actually purple. Then, litmus paper is blue or red, depending on which one you have. So, let us now look at the color changes. In an acid, how does phenolphthalein behave here? So this is my phenolphthalein indicator. This is a few drops of hydrochloric acid. This is the wrong test. Hydrochloric acid, then I have another test tube having a base. So if we added phenolphthalein to this, to an acid, it remains colorless. To a base, it turns pink. So base pink is colorless. Then looking at methyl orange, methyl orange, methyl orange in a base, the base, then this one acid. So base in an acid. So base is here. Then I add to an acid also, just yes, few drops. So you see that in a base it's yellow, in an acid it is red. So red, yellow. Now litmus solution and litmus paper. Litmus solution, I have it here. Say so it's purple in color. And add it to this. This is the, the color. It's very dark purple. So this is the color. If we add it to another, this is litmus solution. It's purple in the color. So if we add it to an acid, let me first put here an acid. It's my acid, nitric acid, I'm using it. So the base is this side. So just add a few drops. Let me just use this direct. Propers. So I add it, the acid, kind of pink, red, something like that. Then I add it to a base. So you see that this is blue. It's blue. Uh, blue, this in an acid, it's red or pink. This is blue. Uh, the paper, if it's blue paper, blue turns red. Then red remains red. Here, 
blue remains blue then red turns blue turns blue universal indicator will have various colors depending on if the acid is very strong so let's demonstrate the use of universal indicator briefly here so my universal indicator if you are using a universal indicator then you must have a universal indicator chart or ph scale for the universal indicator here so i have this let me just support it a bit here this scale they always provide it to you in class because the supplier has always sent it together with the indicator so this time let me use lemon juice here to show something here so i have a lemon here so let me squeeze some lemon juice and use the universal indicator to tell which ph it is so universal indicator added to lemon juice you compare the color with the pH chart. So it's around here. That's why it's lemon juice. Uh, but you have some many other examples which can show that same pH range. Uh, like here I have uh, gastric acid, which is also has a pH of 2, like lemon juice. So gastric acid is actually the hydrochloric acid there. Battery acid, sulfuric acid has around here so we can also add it to and also add it to maybe an alkali like sodium hydroxide to see what happens so, sodium hydroxide here so sodium hydroxide added here then add the indicator universal indicator and compare so this is behavior so it's around the here. So sodium hydroxide being a strong base it has a pH of about 14 there. So that's it on indicators. Now, some indicators are not commercial. We make them local, locally made indicators from plant materials. So that's what I'm discussing briefly. Indicators from plant sources. So we have indicators from plant sources. We've discussed commercial ones, then we're on indicators from plant extracts. So now normally colored petals of flowers are used as good indicators. Any flower that is colored contains dyes. So these indicators are made of dyes which have the ability to change color. Normally those dyes are chemical compounds which you learn in your study as you go on with chemistry here. So indicators from plant extract are extracted from colored petals of flowers. Now me have brought along with me here red cabbages here. So how do you make an indicator from red cabbage? indicator from red cabbage i've already made one here but i'll just tell you what i did so this is the indicator from red cabbage here it also has a range of color changes depending on acidity so kind of behaves as if it is a universal indicator so how do i make red cabbage indicator just a demo here uh if you are time bad just have a few uh the leaves and break just demonstrate this so if you are time bad and you don't have time you make it like this just have some leaves you break it tiny or use a knife or if, if you can break just break into very small small pieces very very small pieces then uh, up to around halfway 
up to around halfway, just yeah, small pieces. Around halfway. You can do it to other flowers like hibiscus, bongenvillae. So add some water, just slightly higher than the slightly higher than the the mixture. Then you heat heat until it boils for some time. So you'll heat it for some time. In case you have used the water as a solvent, so you'll heat this mixture for some time. When it has thoroughly boiled and has extracted the indicator, you remove it. Then you just decant off that mixture after decanting off, because filtration of these compounds might even uh, take long to pass through a filter paper. So you just decant off. This is the indicator that I decanted off. I just boil like I've done. It's kind of blue in water. Water has made it to appear as if it's blue, but it's purple. So, so uh, that's how you make that indicator. You can also just put it in cold water and leave it overnight. You'll have found it has extracted what you want. Or the water can't extract very well if you are not boiling. So you just have now to use other solvents like ethanol. Uh, propano can work well in extracting that compound. So you put it like overnight and it stays. Then you find the indicator extracted already. You can use it on uh, hibiscus, you can use it on colored petals. So let's test this indicator. Uh, red cabbage indicator. So red cabbage in an acid in a base. Then in neutral medium, here we expected it to be purple. So uh, now in an acid, how will it behave? This red cabbage indicator. So it should give this purplish color, but when you add some water, sometimes the color can be affected and it turns kind of blue. So it is going into kind of a bluish state, but the purple still remains there. So when we add that to the acid, what happens? So what happens in an acid? Let's try to add the indicator. This is my acid, nitric acid. I'm using it here. My, my test tubes is already done. Let's see if can add one here. So let me use the acid here and see how the uh, the red cabbage indicator will behave here. So this is reduce the volume. So you see that it's turning red or pink. So you can use red here. These colors can slightly vary a little. Uh, we can also use an alkali. So let me use a base for the cabbage indicator. Now it's kind of green, kind of yellowish green. Now the colors change a little. Kind of yellow, it has some yellow, it has some green. So it, now red cabbage indicator will also be affected by color changes a little bit depending on uh, the acidity level or alkalinity level. So it can appear red, purplish, can kind of appear violet, violet is close to purple, appear blue, so appear green, then appear yellow. So there is 10, there is 10, then uh, 14, yellowish, so if the pH is about 14, like sodium hydroxide, I think you notice that it's going into yellow. Yeah, so the best color here would be yellow. They showed the kind of green, but varied. So this is green, about 12. So blue green, and just have it there. Blue green color. Uh, this is because of the variation in the acidity of this uh, kind of mixture here that we are testing the universal. I mean the uh, 
the plant, the red cabbage indicator. That's why you will see the color might not be fixed as you expect. Now let's look at the chemical properties. Chemical properties of acids and bases. Now, uh, we are going to start with chemical properties. Chemical properties of acids. Now, chemical properties we refer to chemical reactions. So, we notice that uh, uh, acids can react reaction with metals. So look at reaction with carbonates, with carbon with bases first. Then we shall finally look at reaction with carbon. Let's examine how they react with metals with the few illustrations here. So how do acids react with metals? So how do acids react with metals? So to react, let's just have a simple reaction. I'm picking a magnesium ribbon here to just demonstrate how an acid reacts with a metal. Uh, this piece of magnesium ribbon. So I'm just going to pick a small piece here. How magnesium ribbon reacts with An acid. So let me just light my banner here so that I test for hydrogen gas. Then I'm going to add an acid here and cover the mouth. Then I set ready my burning sprint. I'm setting it ready there. So adding hydrochloric acid to this, I close this mouth. Then I want to test this gas. I think you hear that. The gas is hydrogen because we are hearing that it's burning, it's, it's burning, it's burning with a pop sound. So the reaction keeps taking place. There is vigorous effervescence due to the liberation of hydrogen gas. So here metal plus acid, we produce what we call salts plus hydrogen. We shall discuss a salt later, but this hydrogen is characterized by this effervescence here. So whenever you react with an acid with a metal, you liberate a salt and hydrogen. Let's take an example, my magnesium here plus hydrochloric acid. Normally the acids we use here must be dilute. So the acid should be dilute so that it gives acidic properties. So I'll get salts from magnesium, salts from hydrochloric acid are called chlorides. So I get magnesium chloride plus hydrogen. Then salts from sulfuric acid are called sulfates. So here we have magnesium plus hydrochloric acid is HCl to give us magnesium chloride plus hydrogen. To come up with this chemical formula, we are basing on actually the valences. Magnesium has a valence of two, chloride has a valence of one. So these two comes here, then we balance. You can watch me another video how we, we can come up with chemical equation. So acid, metal plus acid must give you salt and hydrogen. So a salt has a metallic part, then the negative and attached to it there. We can discuss later how a salt is and how it is formed. So this is reaction of acids with metals. Let's look at reaction of acids with bases. A base is either an oxide or hydroxide. So any can be reacted with an acid. So if I have an oxide, 
let me pick an oxide here so maybe magnesium oxide with me here is a base then add nitric acid here and I try to shake try to shake normal acids are corrosive so shaking directly might affect you so we see that it kind of dissolves to form a colorless solution you shake thoroughly shake thoroughly so the white powder uh, will definitely dissolve after some time to form a colorless solution now oxides are normally less soluble they take long to dissolve some of them so you can try to warm a little bit if it's an oxide but if it's a metal most metals already dissolve so when you try to warm a little the compound really dissolves because this heat increases the speed of the chemical reaction for normal the oxides uh, so uh, base plus acid we say that first you get salt plus water and it's called a neutralization reaction like I've used magnesium oxide plus dilute nitric acid then we are receiving magnesium nitrate salts from nitric acid are called nitrates while salts from sulfuric acid are called sulfates so plus hydrogen gas so we can have magnesium reacting with nitric acid to give us what we call magnesium nitrate plus hydrogen so this one we balance it you, you can check my video on how to write and balance chemical equation so this is how we can use also a hydroxide the products are the same salt and water so you can look at a carbonate and hydrogen carbonate as last chemical reactions here so and have carbonates number three reaction with carbonates or metal or hydrogen carbonates so here normally acid plus carbonate normally produce salt water three things carbon dioxide gas so for example let me take an example of sodium carbonate here and demonstrate something to you so sodium carbonate is right away with me here pick one spatula then add it to that then i'm going to add an acid to it but I will be ready to test for carbon dioxide gas using uh, lime water. So when you are carrying out this reaction, have lime water with you at hand. Let me check around here. So we expect you to do this. I'm using just a demo here. Might not necessarily show you what will happen exactly. But uh, what you do, we prepare our solution of lime water and make sure this delivery tube is cocked and it enters and touches the lime water then we add an acid to this and so let me add hydrochloric acid here so when i add i cover it briefly then try to close here so when you close here you observe for some time there is a effervescence here effervescence indicates a presence of a gas so there is carbon dioxide coming off here and centering the lime water so after some time lime water should be able to turn milky should be able to give some kind of this mix some kind of this appearance in the color so that's the evidence for carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is tested using lime water so such an example like i've used sodium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid 
I must get salts from hydrochloric acid that are called chlorides. So I get sodium chloride plus water, then plus carbon dioxide. We can change it into a chemical equation by saying sodium carbonate, because this was a solid, plus hydrochloric acid gives us sodium chloride. Then plus water, plus carbon dioxide. You can check for my videos on how to write chemical formula. So that's how you arrive at the reaction there. So those are some of the reactions of acids with other substances. Let's look at the last two things here. Application of neutralization reactions in usual life. Neutralization. Reactions or then applications of acids and bases. Acids and bases. So here we can look at acids where they are applied, then look at bases where they are applied. Yeah, now. Neutralization reaction is a reaction between a base and an acid, and we said an acid has a counter effect on the base, as well as a base has a counter effect on the acid. So we can look at a B sting, hearing from a B sting. So a B sting has formic acid. We normally neutralize that pain and uh, cause healing by uh, adding there or applying uh, uh, banana peelings. We can get ash from banana peelings, or we can get banana peeling, then try to smear around this uh, place where the bee has stung. So, contains formic acid, which is neutralized by banana peelings. Contains formic acid, which is methanoic acid. Formic acid neutralized using banana peelings. Then we can also have uh, uh, anti-ulcer drugs, so acid reflux and ulcers. Acid reflux, shock ulcers, they are different. So here we normally add, we normally take anti-acids to actually neutralize the excess acid in the stomach, which might be causing discomfort. And acids contain bases such as aluminium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, so they can react with acid, uh, acid uh, stomach acid called hydrochloric acid to neutralize it. So there, those are some few uh, examples of neutralization reactions. There are many other reactions, so read about them there. So applications of acids and bases. These acids we have have various applications, organic acids, Vinegar has various applications in, in making for us salads, the taste for salads. So many of these acids are used in healing, such as citric acids are normally taken, ascorbic acids are normally taken to really to, to ease from uh, respiratory problems such as flu and uh, improve also the immune system concerning fighting uh, flu and uh, associated cough diseases. So we have uh, battery acid, sulfuric acid used in batteries, nitric acid used in making explosives. This is car battery, making explosives, and also fertilizer. Uh, stomach acid used to ease digestion, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid. Uh, we have vinegar, ethanoic acid used in vinegar for making salads, ethanoic acid. Here, bases such as ammonia are used in making fertilizers, ammonia, fertilizers, and also softening hard water, softening hard water. Other bases also exist such as amines, which are used in various applications, such as making uh, plastics, 
and so on. Even hydrochloric acid is used in making plastics. Now, thank you for watching. I want to see you in the next video. Please subscribe if you're a first viewer and also like the video. Bye.